My name is Mark Kranzdorf, and during this next musculoskeletal core lecture series session, I'd like to address the imaging approach to soft tissue masses focusing on MR imaging. Specifically at the completion of this session, what I'd like you to be able to do is construct a framework for the evaluation of soft tissue masses, recognize ways to establish a diagnosis or a differential diagnosis, and when that's not possible, to be able to identify features which will allow you to distinguish between benign and malignant lesions. And for this session, I'll use the term masses for uh, true tumors and tumor-like lesions that may present as soft tissue masses. And the way I'd like to do this is by start with a few introductory comments, then talk about a general approach, how we make a diagnosis, the distinction of benign versus malignant, and how we can use MR imaging and uh, information that we have on our evaluation of lesions to come up with a reasonable and meaningful differential diagnosis. So let's begin. When we look at the overall incidence of cancer in the United States, and we take a look at soft tissue tumors, true soft tissue malignancies, they really pale in numbers as comparison to lung, breast, or colorectal carcinoma. But when you consider that there are at least estimated to be a hundred benign lesions that present as a soft tissue mass for every one malignancy, and we look at that number, then all of a sudden it really becomes something that we see on MR imaging not infrequently at all, and it is something that we have to be familiar with. So, although true sarcomas are relatively uncommon, soft tissue masses are certainly not, and as radiologists we must be able to evaluate these effectively. Now, as a general approach to soft tissue tumors, we really need to think of our exam objectives. And certainly what we want to do is make a diagnosis, be able to obtain enough imaging information to adequately stage the lesion, and by that I certainly mean the local staging to determine its extent, as well as get enough information so that we can plan an accurate biopsy and have the surgeon have enough information to plan surgery. Our evaluation starts by obtaining a complete history, and this is really incredibly important and something that we have to remember. This means going through the medical record, and certainly when that's not available, and even today, if I have a patient from an outside institution that comes in with no history, I will make sure that I am there to talk to the patient or that someone is to make sure that we get an appropriate history because we base our protocoling of the exam based on the information we get during this initial evaluation. Certainly if there's no physical exam in which someone has examined the mass, I'll do it myself. And then I always like to evaluate and review the radiographs or if an ultrasound was done prior to the MR imaging, those images as well. And they're all part and should be part of your routine evaluation prior to MR imaging. As radiologists, we're often told to take cases as unknowns. And we'd look at this and we'd say, yes, I certainly see the rib and rims, ribs with some scalloping. I see the multiple lobulated pleural-based masses. And I'd be very pleased with myself to make the diagnosis of neurofibromatosis in here shown at the autopsy imaging. We can see these neurofibromas running along the uh, inferior margins of the ribs. But certainly, patients often are very much aware of their process that they have or the diseases that they have, and they'll be only too willing to tell you about them if you take the time to ask. So it is something that's very important prior to your doing an MR study. Just a nice example of neurofibromatosis. Well, what are some of the questions I like to ask? I like to find out if there is a history of a previous lesion or any interesting or important previous medical history the patient might have. Has there been radiation therapy or surgery? Has there been previous trauma? Are they on anticoagulants? Importantly, how was the mass discovered? Is this a slowly growing or slowly enlarging painless mass, which is very typical of a soft tissue sarcoma? Certainly when they're large, they can be painful, although that more often suggests an inflammatory process. Also, has there been a change in size? Again, slow interval growth is typical of a sarcoma, 
When we see a lesion that becomes larger with exercise, perhaps we can think of a vascular lesion or hemangioma. But it is important to get as much history as you can prior to the MR imaging. This is a case where history was incredibly important. This patient came in for evaluation of a painful mass in the popliteal fossa. The mass had become painful while he was flying back from New Zealand to the United States on a business trip. And when he spoke to the patient, he said when he was 15 years old, his family physician had told him he had a hemangioma behind the knee, that it was nothing to worry about and he should leave it alone. And interestingly, this was exactly where the mass was and that had now become painful. Certainly looking at it, you can see a complex mass on fluid sensitive sequences with some area of fat and subacute blood within it, certainly consistent with that history of thrombosis in a large cavernous hemangioma intramuscular in the posterior aspect of the knee. And again, post-contrast imaging nicely shows the thrombos vessels within it as well as the areas of enhancement uh, around them and again subsequently pro proven at surgery to be a large vessel hemangioma with thrombosis. We'll talk a little bit about the distinction between benign and malignant and here we can see this large mass within the thigh. It's big, it's deep, it's heterogeneous, certainly all the worrisome features of malignancy, but I show this case because the mass in and of itself is relatively nonspecific. But as with history, radiographs can be incredibly important because when we look at the radiograph in this patient, we see this cloud-like area of increased opacity in the medial aspect of the thigh, certainly typical of what we see with an osseous producing tumor allowing us to make a diagnosis with great confidence of an extraskeletal osteosarcoma, a lesion that we know has a very guarded prognosis and this patient succumbed to metastatic disease approximately six months later. Again, just pointing the importance of the initial evaluation and processes such as radiographs in that evaluation. Now, as far as the technique, I think it's important to emphasize that one size does not fit all. You need to tailor the exam to the mass based on your evaluation of the radiographs and the history. And it is very important. And by doing that, you can get optimum results. And there are a lot of features or factors that you can adjust as you go through to base this on. One of the most important is field of view. Now, you have to remember, Generally, we like a small field of view to get the optimum signal to noise so we can evaluate the small anatomic features to allow us to get the best evaluation of the local anatomy to diagnose and stage the tumor appropriately. And this is variable depending upon the size of the mass. Often, when a surgeon orders a study, he may order it not recognizing how you interpret that order. For example, here was a patient who had a lesion around his hip. He had an MR done. You can see the lesion behind the hip, but it's very difficult to evaluate it in relation to the local anatomy. This was ordered as a pelvis for a hip lesion, a patient presenting with hip pain. And because it was ordered as a pelvis, it was done at a pelvis. And remember, a pelvis is generally done at a large field of view. In this case, it was 37 centimeters. When we do a hip, we usually do it on a small field of view and compare the ability to look at the anatomic detail on a small field of view versus a large field of view. Remember, reducing the field of view in half will increase the spatial resolution generally by about four. And certainly nicely demonstrated here where we can see the iliocellus tendon, follow it down and follow it directly into the mass. And on corresponding T1 rated on the original image, very difficult to appreciate the relationship between the synovial line tendon and the mass. Now, on the higher resolution image, we can look at it, we can see the mass, and notice that the mass has a signal intensity relatively similar to that of fat within the marrow. So we have a mass intimately associated with the synovial line process with intermediate signal intensity, and allows us to note when we look at the pre-existing enhanced image that it enhances intensely and make a diagnosis with fairly great confidence of a giant cell tumor of tendon sheath or what more currently would be called a localized extra-articular tenosynovial giant cell tumor. It is also important to get involved with the imaging as it is being done. 
And certainly for tumor cases, I like to be available to answer questions that the technologists may have, and I also like to check them as they're being done. This was a patient who came in with a soft tissue swelling about the knee without a specific area of involvement. So we did the image of the knee on a relatively large field of view, and I've collimated off the back so you can look at the detail of the more anterior portion. T1 and axial T1 and fluid sensitive sequences were done, which really didn't show a mass. Now, in general, I don't like to get the contralateral side because most of the time it really is of no value. But when a patient comes in with a mass like symptoms and I don't see a mass, I always like to get the contralateral side for comparison. And if you look at that in this case, you can see the overgrowth of adipose tissue, which is why the patient was presenting for evaluation. So by getting involved and looking at it as it's being done, now we have this study where we've really only done three sequences, but yet we've not only shortened the exam, not required to give contrast, and can make a definitive diagnosis of lipomatosis of the lower extremity as the source of the patient's presenting complaint, really doing our job and certainly making it easier for the patient and requiring less imaging time. Now there are some certain or there are certain standard sequences that we like to use and these are the ones that I typically will use. I like to get good anatomic imaging typically with axial T1 and T2 weighted images and I still like to use non-fat suppressed T2 weighted images and we'll talk about that in a moment as well as of course fat suppressed images and the best long axis imaging either with a PD fat sat or a stir depending upon the fat saturation as required. And here we have a patient with a, a lesion in the subcutaneous tissue of the ankle. I think you can see it very nicely on T1 weighted image and corresponding T2 weighted images. And you'll notice on the right of the screen the fat suppressed T2 weighted images. And I like to get T2 weighted images because I like to compare the signal intensity of the lesion on a strongly weighted T2 weighted images to things that I know, for example, the high signal intensity in fluid that we can see around the tendon sheaths or sometimes within the joint, and the intermediate signal intensity associated with fat that we can see in the marrow and the subcutaneous fat. And often when we just look at fat suppressed imaging, again noticing the fat, and we look at it on a fluid sensitive sequence with fat suppression everything tends to be bright, artificially brightened. And here by looking at it and comparing it to the intermediate signal on fat, noticing that this is even a little lower than that, that sends a message that this is probably more cellular, has a more fibrotic or, or uh, a more fibrotic morphology, uh, more fibroblastic, and certainly let us include a mixo-inflammatory fibroblastic sarcoma in the diagnosis or in the differential because of its subcutaneous extremity position uh, and knowing that that's one of the lesions that can occur although a rare tumor in this location based on its signal intensities and anatomic location. In addition to our standard sequences there are some special sequences that can be used quite commonly. Ones that we use most frequently are gradient images which are really very nice to pick up hemosiderin or evidence of previous, previous hemorrhage as well as fat suppressed T1 weighted images. We certainly use gradient very frequently. This is a patient who came in with had a mass-like area around the ankle. You can see on even conventional T2 weighted images without fat suppression, the loss of signal on T2 weighted sequences indicative of magnetic susceptibility from the hemosiderin, nicely shown. And of course, on gradient imaging, there was really extensive blooming, again, confirming the presence of hemosiderin in this patient with pigmented villonodular synovitis now, which would be, of course, diffuse intraarticular tenosynovial giant cell tumor. And again, the gradient echo sequence. I also like for tumor patients to have fat suppressed T1 weighted images. Now we can generally see subacute blood fairly nicely on T1 weighted images, but certainly we see it to better advantage on post or on fat suppressed T1 weighted images as demonstrated in this case. And the other thing I like about the fat suppressed T1 weighted images that if you do give contrast, you can actually subtract the pre-gadolinium fat suppressed T1 from the post-contrast image and 
in doing getting the really the full uh, idea of exactly what is truly enhancing and certainly if you're planning a biopsy this allows you to uh, target your biopsy to the enhancing viable portions of the tumor rather than the necrotic areas uh, which really becomes very important in getting appropriate tissue for diagnosis. Contrast can be very useful as shown in that previous case and again just to emphasize it here we can see a high grade undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma and you might say well where is the best place to biopsy should it be the high signal intensity area the more intermediate signal intensity area certainly can be difficult to say but there's no question once you give contrast as to where you should target for your biopsy as nicely demonstrated in this case as well and just another example showing how the contrast enhanced imaging really does reflect the vascularity of the tumor in this solitary fibrous tumor of the lower extremity. Now we won't talk about the quantitative techniques because they're generally uh, often in special circumstances but there certainly are a whole number of additional quantitative techniques that we can use to both measure and quantify various features that may allow us or help us to make specific diagnoses and we'll save that for a different session. So our approach what I can say is know the objectives of your exam, review the radiographs, monitor the study, and gadolinium can be ext extremely helpful, uh, particularly in biopsy planning and surgical planning. Okay. Now, as far as diagnosis, there's a whole host of diagnoses that have been described in the literature, whether they be vascular lesions, various bone and cartilage lesions, many of the fibrous, certainly almost all of the lipomatous and peripheral nerve type tumors, as well as the synovial and many tumor-like lesions. And generally speaking, we make our diagnosis based on a number of features. That includes the signal intensity of the lesion, its pattern of growth, more recently its location has become very important, as have certain specific signs and findings. So just by way of example, we have this patient who comes in with a paraspinal mass and we can see this lobulated mass in the paraspinal area with a signal intensity which is identical to that of the subcutaneous fat and certainly it was that way on all pulse sequences and we can make the diagnosis of a lipoma based on the signal intensity and here an intramuscular lipoma again with the signal intensity of the lesion mirroring that of fat on all pulse sequences. Here another patient this one who is being done with a surface coil and we can see what looks like somewhat dirty fat but notice again the same distance from the coil the exact same signal intensity in this an intramuscular lipoma lipoma based on its signal intensity intramuscular on its location which was confirmed at surgery another patient with fat within the lesion which of course now this is only a small percentage of the lesion in this large otherwise fairly non-specific mass seeing the fat being intermediate on a non-fat suppressed T2 weighted image, allowing us to make the diagnosis of a liposarcoma. And of course, myxoid liposarcoma being the most common, representing about 75% of those seen within the extremity and demonstrated here. Now here another patient with a mass, and if you'll notice, high signal intensity which sort of infiltrates the soft tissue. There's some fat in it in this very lace-like pattern, and this pattern of growth in this position or this pattern of fat within it is highly characteristic of vascular tumors, in this case an intramuscular hemangioma, which infiltrates the muscle as it extends. And of course, those of you who are very observant will notice some signal voids, in this case secondary to the flebolus, which in it, which were identified on radiograph. Location is very important, and we often look just like with bone tumors where we can talk about which bone it's in and where it is in the bone, whether it's in the shaft, the metadiaphysis, the metaphysis, or the epiphysis, we can use that in the evaluation of soft tissue masses as to where it is in the body and where in the anatomy, what compartment it's in, whether it's in the muscle, between the muscle, in the subcutaneous tissues, or in and around joints. By way of example, this elastofibroma with its trocentic shape and classic location below the tip of the scapula and we can see it on MR imaging with its well-known fibrous component 
showing lower signal intensity similar to that of muscle on T1 and T2 weighted images with some encased strandy fat within it, very characteristic of an elastofibroma. And you might look at this and say, well, geez, this is just a non-specific mass. But if you say, well, it's really not just anywhere, but it's really in the distal radial ulnar joint. And you think of those joints, and then you think of those tumors that occur in joints. And when we correlate it with the radiograph showing this remodeling, this long-standing mass causing some remodeling of the radius in the region of the distal radial ulnar joint with this fairly characteristic pattern of mineralization. And then think of those lesions that tend to occur in and around joints. When you look at the list, which is relatively short, you say certainly this must be a conglomerate mass of synovial chondromatosis, a diagnosis which was confirmed at surgery. And finally, there are a few associated findings such as edema that we can see very nicely or inflammatory change around this particular lesion. You can see it in this poorly defined abnormal signal surrounding it, extending into the soft tissues with this more mineralized area centrally within it corresponding to the mineralization and this ossification more mature peripherally seen on radiograph, highly characteristic of intermediate phase myositis ossificans. So, we used to say we can make a diagnosis in about a third or quarter to a third of cases, and those were based on old studies, often without any correlation radiographically, and I think most today would agree that we can make the diagnosis in the majority, and sometimes a very significant number of cases, based on an evaluation of the history, the radiographs, and the MR imaging. Now, when we can't do that, how can we separate benign from malignant? Well, we can make some generalizations. In general, malignant lesions are larger, deeper, more heterogeneous, and grow like a mass. And think about that hemangioma we saw in comparison to this sarcoma, which grows centripetally, compressing the normal tissue around it. And this is the classic growth pattern with a sarcoma, and they're often very well-defined, compressing that tissue around it. Now, you may look at this and say, I don't know what that is, but no self-respecting sarcoma would grow like that, and you'd be absolutely correct. It's there, it's there, it goes behind the hip. I mean, it goes everywhere, certainly in this patient with a lymphangioma of the pelvis. We can say that malignancy is predicted with the highest sensitivity when a lesion has a high signal intensity on T2, a diameter larger than 33 millimeters, and is inhomogeneous on T1 and it can be predicted with the highest specificity when we have necrosis, bone or neurovascular involvement, and a mean diameter of more than 66 millimeters. This is a typical malignancy. It's big, it's deep, it's heterogeneous, in this case on both T1 and T2, and this is evil till proven otherwise. Okay. Now, what do you do about cases like this? Well, this is tough. This was a nine-year-old. He came in, his parents noted that he had this little mass in his forearm and had been there for about five months of observation. It started out like a small chickpea size and grew to the size of a walnut, but it didn't hurt, but it was growing. And they were very right to bring it in. Radiographs were negative, but when I have a case like this, I say it's an indeterminate as far as benign versus malignant, although the deep location in the history of a slowly growing painless mass is very suspect for malignancy, and this was a synovial sarcoma in the form of this nine-year-old. And here another patient with a synovial sarcoma, this which had been observed for three years prior to medical attention, showing a more typical appearance of synovial sarcoma with this large hemorrhagic mass. So, in general, big deep and heterogeneous are all bad signs and of course the most specific for malignancy is necrosis or bone or neurovascular involvement. So how can we do differentials just like we would for osseous tumors when we evaluate with soft tissue tumors? Well, when MR is nonspecific, it's useful to give a differential based on the tumor prevalence in the population, the patient's age and the lesion location. So if I showed you this case in a 16-year-old and said he came in with a mass that was painless and now it's starting to hurt, we can see it, we can see it growing into bone, so we automatically know that's highly specific for malignancies. Well, where do we go from here? And certainly here at the surgical assessment, you can see the mass and the intraosseous extension, which beautifully correlates. How do we come up with a differential? Well, common things are common when you hear athletes think of horses, not zebras, and certainly not unicorns. And so you go to the literature. 
And we know that more than 70% of malignant tumors fall into eight diagnoses and more than two thirds of benign uh, tumors fall into eight diagnoses. And so if we look at the literature and look at a 16 year old and look at the foot and ankle at the most common lesions, this is what we see. And so what I like to do is if I'm not sure what it is, I look at the literature and say, okay, well, let's go through the list. The most common lesion would be a synovial sarcoma. Is that good in this case? And I say, well, yeah, it is. They tend to be deep. They tend to invade bone as does MFH. Those are the two most common lesions that would invade bone. Yeah, that's a good thought. Is it calcified? That would be helpful on the radiograph. No, it wasn't, but that's still statistically my first choice. How about clear cell sarcoma? Well, they tend to be more on the aponeuroses than they do in the deep soft tissue. So I don't like that as much. And their signal intensity is different and their imaging appearance different. So not so much. And then I'd go through each of these and see if they fit in. And when that's done, I'd come up and put them in my order of likelihood. And certainly synovial sarcoma would have to be my first choice. And if I said that in this case, I would be absolutely right. So differential diagnosis you can do. And again, based on statistics, that is patient age, tumor prevalence, and lesion location. So in summary, MR imaging should be interpreted with the knowledge of the clinical history, the physical findings, and the radiographic, or if radiographs weren't done, the ultrasonographic features. Imaging is often characteristic. When imaging is nonspecific, benign, and malignant lesions cannot be reliably differentiated based solely on MR in isolation, and really it needs to be correlated completely. I always like to think about soft tissue tumors as Clint Eastwood's old movie, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. If I know what that is, that's good. If I don't know what it is, I always think of things that it could be that are bad, and by doing that, I make sure things never get ugly. Thank you very much.